during this during this process, I I will stop the video so that way we can focus on the slides. And then when we get to certain pause points where we can um, open up the forum to questions, then uh, I'll turn my video back on and then you know we can kind of dig in a little bit deeper. So with that moving, so moving forward. And a quick overview of the presentation. So COVID-19 has consumed all of our lives one way or another uh, over the past couple of years. Really, it's hard to believe that it's been almost two years. So it's everywhere. It's in the news, it's in our restaurant policies, it's on Facebook, not to mention if you're someone who gets sick or knows someone who is sick it's then become a literal part of your life. So today I'm just gonna go over a few topics. Um, you know, COVID has, like I said, it's become expansive and can cover multiple areas over multiple hours. But what I'm gonna to cover today includes some background information on the current COVID vaccines that are available in the United States, the development process to licensure, some myths and misconceptions that you likely have heard. Um, I'll also be mindful of the time and we'll be on the lookout for questions after each section. So let's start by focusing on the basics of COVID-19 vaccines. Right now, there are three vaccines that are available to the US public. There's Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines that require two doses. While right now, the Johnson & Johnson vaccines require just one dose. Boosters for each of these vaccines are currently under discussion and some scenarios um, are, um, and then some scenarios have recently um, been approved. So Pfizer has received full FDA approval down to the age of 16. Um, it is still under emergency use authorization for ages 12 to 15. Moderna and Johnson and Johnson only have emergency use authorization from the FDA for ages 18 and up. A lot of this has to do with the fact that Pfizer was one of the first to provide data. Um, and so Moderna and Johnson and Johnson are gonna be fo soon following through with many of the same steps. Uh, it's just that they'll be a little bit further behind. So as of yesterday, 63% of the United States population has had at least one dose. During the phase three trial for those that are currently available, about 30 to 45,000 received at least one dose. And since then, hundreds of millions of people have received the vaccine in the United States. About three and a half billion shots have been given worldwide. So we've had the best data in such a short amount of time that we've ever had for any vaccine. So many people are afraid that the vaccines are, are too new and that they may trigger unexpected or life-threatening side effects, perhaps even months or years later. And, and that's understandable. It's true that reports of new side effects can sometimes take months to emerge as a vaccine goes from populations of thousands in clinical trials to millions in the real world. Um, you know, we encounter, the vaccines encounter natural variations in human responses along the way, which can create differences in side effects. But more than 100 million Americans have already passed that point in their vaccinations. And the first participants in the clinical trials are non, now beyond a year. The vast majority of side effects that are usually exposed from vaccine occur within the first six weeks of administration. Uh, those that go on beyond that can happen in rare circumstances, uh, but it's very uncommon. There's only one vaccine that's truly known that has actually caused uh, a side effect um, you know, multiple years um, afterwards, which is the dengue vaccine. And that's something that is being highly vetted for the COVID vaccine. So, so far, incidents of severe side effects for the coronavirus, uh, such as, you know, syndromes that you may not have heard before, like Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, which can cause numbness and tingling in your fingers and your legs, um, heart inflammation, those are very rare. And they were discovered quickly because they're on official lists of potential problems to watch for. So what's more is that all these and other side effects appear soon after someone has taken the vaccine, as I had just said. <clears throat> this does suggest that people don't uh, need to worry as much about the delayed long-term reactions. And this picture does fit with the modern history of vaccinations, which as I said, um, most new immunizations have been incredibly safe 
and even the most severe effects have reared their ugly heads just right away within the first six weeks. So side effects nearly, almost nearly always occur within the first weeks of being vaccinated. So those who enrolled in the clinical trials and are now a year out from that did a tremendous public service by offering their time and even their body and their health to test out these vaccines for the American public. The concerns that, um, the concerns that something will spring up later with COVID is not impossible, as I had mentioned, but based on what we know, they're very unlikely. A key reason for this is for this limited window of the side effects is the short time that all vaccines stay in our body. So unlike medicines that people take every day or even every week, vaccines are generally administered once or even just a small handful of time over a lifetime. And so the, the particles in the vaccine that are used in say Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson Johnson are very fragile. And oftentimes they're out of your body in a day or so. So with COVID-19, regulators have had have added several extra pairs of eyes to watch out for adverse events um, and report them as quickly as possible. And this has become an entire international endeavor. And so one thing that this illustrates too is what are we comparing the vaccine to? We're comparing the vaccine and the vaccine side effects to what are the side effects of natural infection. And in comparison to the risk of some of the most worrisome side effects for any of the vaccine is much less than the risk of death, let alone hospitalization or the risk of long-term long -term effects that people are seeing with long COVID. Death is much more common than either hospital or is much less common than either hospitalization or long, long COVID. And as you can see, death from COVID is much more likely uh, than you know, a severe adverse event that may not even result in death from a COVID vaccine. And so how do vaccines work? So vaccines work by teaching the body to recognize an invader, such as SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19. So this sounds an alarm in the body, calling the fighter cells and proteins that are part of our immune system into action. Ultimately, this will help the body to prevent or control an infection and reduce the severity of the disease by generating what is called an immune response. So as you know, we have two types of COVID-19 vaccines that are currently available on the market. There are mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna, and then a DNA vaccine like Johnson & Johnson. So I'll go over in a little more detail about how these work. mRNA vaccines. So this is the first time mRNA vaccines have been available to the mass public, but they have actually been around for decades. So to give you an idea of how they work, I'll walk you through the, the first steps, or I'll start by working, walking you through the first steps. So on the left, you have SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. The little red legs that are projecting off of it are called the spike protein. So this is part of the virus that we have found to be the most vulnerable and has been the main target for vaccines and therapeutics. So the spike protein is turned into something called mRNA. mRNA is something that your body makes all the time for all the proteins that are in your body. It's the blueprint from your DNA that is used to create the proteins found in your body actually. So for the vaccines, scientists created the virus's mRNA or the virus's instructions of how to make the spike protein. And then this mRNA or instruction sheet is then put inside an oily bubble or a lipid bubble is what other people would call it um, so that it can get into the muscle cells of your body. The mRNA vaccines are composed of many of these tiny little oily particles with the mRNA inside of them. So someone when someone receives the injection and the particles enter a human cell, each one of our cells has multiple little factories in them. Uh, these factories are called ribosomes, but that's not important right now. Um, but these little factories receive the mRNA messages all the time. Um, this time, these factories receive a blueprint on how to make the spike protein. It produces the spike protein and then takes it outside the cell so that it can be distributed or send messages to the rest of your body. However, your body is not any old factory, okay? It's a military factory, and there are all sorts of security and quality control checks. So the security agents of your body uh, notice, hmm, so this doesn't look like something your body usually makes, and sets off an alarm. 
This alarm brings whatever combat cells or special operations your body can provide to get rid of this product. The antibodies produced are the combat special forces of your body. So they're trained to get rid of the threat and they do. These antibodies are combatants then remember this threat. And so any subsequent exposure will mobilize them very quickly. Booster shots in a way act as a sort of fire drill uh, providing practice and in instilling long-term memory against these threats. DNA vaccines uh, like Johnson & Johnson act a little bit differently. I didn't note on the previous slide, but mRNA vaccines do not enter the nucleus of your cell, nor do they modify your DNA in any way. The DNA vaccines also do not modify the DNA in your body, but they do interact with the cell's nucleus where it is held. So DNA vaccines are weakened adenovirus or a weaker form of a virus that causes the common cold. So scientists have used the virus's natural ability to get inside our cells as a way to create a vaccine. So this modified virus goes into your cell, puts the DNA of the spike protein into the nucleus. Um, putting the DNA into the nucleus, like I said, does not integrate it into your own DNA. Instead, it makes the spike protein DNA available so that your body's machinery or your body's factory can then translate it. So using your body's machinery, it then translates it into mRNA and goes through the process that we just previously described, using the factories and special ops forces to create antibodies against the target. So for this next slide, um, I wanna go over how vaccines protect the community. Herd immunity occurs when enough people become immune to a disease to make it spread unlikely. So as a result, the entire community is protected even those who are not themselves immune. So herd immunity is usually achieved through vaccination, but it can also occur through natural infection. So I am gonna lower the PowerPoint really quick just to show this as an animation. There we go. And so you can see right here with this animation, you start with the top left corner where there's the percent vaccinated and you move all the way to the right and then you move down again, all the way to the right, as if you're reading a book. And you can see that based on the percent of people Brittany, vaccinated. Uh, oh, yeah, go just, ahead. I'm sorry, just checking it. I, we can't see the uh, animation. If you oh. can anime. Hmm. I can't seem to figure it out, but I think that I should be able to describe it without doing the animation. So we'll just stick with that. Um, basically what the animation would show, it would show in real time how these networks develop. So the little dots are people. Um, the blue dots are people who are, um, who are unvaccinated and yellow dots are people who are vaccinated. And so kind of like I said before, reading from left to right, uh, you can follow this. Of those who are who are vaccinated, so if no, no nobody is vaccinated, which is what happened at the beginning of the pandemic, you can see that the virus is spread. Um, and what you would see in the animation is that it's spread very quickly. The more and more you become vaccinated, the harder and harder it is for a vaccine to move between people. And eventually, if you read it, something that would be um, quite the achievement, which is 95% vaccination, you can see that spread is very, very minimal. And so one goal of, of vaccination, um, you know, not just to protect your community at large, but also people who, who don't necessarily mount a strong response after vaccination, like those who are elderly or even those who are immunocompromised, this concept of hum herd immunity, it is um, not just, you know, something something for the individual, but also something to protect the overall community as well. All right, so we'll take a few minutes for some questions based on those slides. Faisa, if, if, I'd appreciate it if you would field those. Of course, yes. Um, we have one question here. How many cases can die if vaccinated? Um, also following up that question is if mRNA vaccines have been for decades, what other vaccines have used have used it before the EUA for COVID? Yep. 
so answering your first questions, the uh, number of people who have died from uh, any type of COVID-19 vaccination, uh, you know, whether it's Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, or, you know, even those that are used internationally, is more along the lines of um, less than five people per million or less than 10 people per million, um, I think is probably more conservative estimate. Um, but I, I would, I'd go along the lines of less than five per million. Um, that being said, when you look at people who would be likely to die from um, COVID-19, it's tens of thousands per million. And so the odds of dying from the vaccine is considerably less. Um, not only that, I think that a lot of these deaths were early on. Um, you know, I, I think that when we were still establishing what the side effects are. And so, you know, with the tens of millions of people and really billions of doses that have come across worldwide, we've become better at understanding who might experience these types of side effects. Uh, so we can decide whether that person should or should not get it, um, as well as, you know, some people might require closer monitoring. And so, for instance, waiting for 30 minutes after vaccination um, has actually improved our ability to catch um, a severe allergic event like anaphylaxis. Um, so those types of strategies have really helped out and have improved those numbers over time. Um, other mRNA vaccines. So like I said, this is the first time that we've had mass production of an mRNA vaccine. Um, so mRNA vaccine, like I said, have been along for decades, but they followed what I will go over next, which is a super long pipeline for vaccine development. Um, you know, vaccines have been, development was shortened over this period of time. Generally, it's a 10-year process. Um, mRNA vaccines that now are in the pipeline and going through clinical trials that have been going through long stages of laboratory testing um, include uh, HIV, um, I believe that there's some also available for other emerging infectious diseases like, like Zika virus. Um, so those are ones that are coming up in the pipeline for using mRNA vaccines. And it's a belief that to some extent, mRNA vaccines will become the standard. Um, you know, as I will kind of briefly touch on is that every type of vaccine has its pluses and minuses. And what we've even seen in this pandemic is that uh, mRNA vaccines and DNA vaccines while you know, making improvements in some areas, they also have their imperfections. And so we won't be completely getting rid of the other types of vaccines as well. Um, just one more follow-up question to that is that, have we had cases in which people who have been vaccinated got the, the infection again, COVID again, and then died from it? If so, what are, what are the numbers for that? So you mean subsequently died from COVID or subsequently died from the vaccination itself. So my understanding from this question is that they got the vaccine and then got COVID, got infected again after yeah. the vaccine. And have there been any cases of death? Yep. So the risk of being hospitalized for COVID after receiving vaccination is 0.8%, so less than 1%. If then you are hospitalized, so if you're a part of that 0.8% that gets hospitalized, um, approximately another small percent, about, I would say one to 5% um, have experienced death subsequently from that. Um, typically those who fall into that category are those who have the vaccine, but who later we're gonna be recommending will require booster shots. So they're people who don't usually mount a good response. So that would include people over the age of 65. Um, and that's just a fact of an aging body um, is that you know those special ops forces that we're generating, they just, they get tired. Um, and so that's why booster, shot, sharp, booster shots may be needed to, um, to strengthen them and to, to keep them active. Um, also, people that have certain immunocompromising conditions, even though they get a vaccine, the vaccine can last only for a shorter amount of time. So there's some another group who would need frequent vaccination, more frequent vaccinations as well. Um, so it does end up being just a very small portion and a very special population. Um, I do want to say, though, those who um, might not mount a good response could be somebody that you know, um, people who are taking chemotherapy for cancer which you know, at some point we've all known somebody who's had cancer and been taking chemotherapy. Um, it is people also with severe, um, severe immunodeficiencies, but I, I like to point out chemotherapy because I think that's one of the most common. Or people who have um, uh, 
rheumat or autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, and they have to take medicines that suppress their immune system or have had a transplant. Those are the types of people who, despite vaccination, um, could still still be at high risk, albeit lower risk than if they had been vaccinated. All right, so I'll, I'll take one more question maybe because I know we have a lot of content to cover. And yep. have, I, I wanna mention that we have two other check-in points in which we're gonna uh, address any questions that you may have. Um, and if we don't get to all of your questions, we'll be sure to uh, compile them, respond to them and send it to you in the follow-up email. With that said, just one more question is, in your expert opinion, do you foresee us having to take the vaccine each year or will, will a booster be uh, a backup? Yeah, that's a complicated it, question. <laughs> um, it's actually a, uh, the question of the moment right now. And I think that uh, what you will see is that that recommendation is going to vary possibly by the type of vaccine um, that you received, for instance. Um, you know, with time, we've learned that there's a slight difference between Pfizer and Moderna, and that Moderna might last a little bit longer than Pfizer. Um, and so current recommendations that are going through the panel is the possibility that certain people at high risk who got the Pfizer vaccine would need a booster, but it's likely that people who received Moderna may not have. Um, similarly, you know, boosters are also being evaluated by Johnson & Johnson to improve its durability as well. Um, with that, um, you know, one thing with COVID that isn't true with other vaccine is that we're collecting data in real time. Um, you know, this pandemic just kind of sprung up upon us. And so, you know, usually when this happens, um, you know, you have 10 years worth of data, say, oh, well, you know, this happened and this trial and this did this, but science is happening in real time. And so a lot of times, you know, it we can't fully answer your questions because we're still collecting the full information on it. And if I could predict the future, I absolutely would, but um, you know, that's not something I'm always good at. So. Thank you, yeah. And I think just one more question as it, this pertains to herd immunity. Lindsay asks, can you relate the herd immunity issue to the current Prince George's County vaccination rate of 58.4%? Um, uh, and what is to be expected with the rate regarding exposure and infection? Let me make sure that I understand that question fully. So what, it, what would the herd immunity be for vaccination for 54.8% you said? Yes, that's the, the first piece of the, the question. Yeah, so I think that the, the major thing with herd immunity, um, also a little bit more complicated than the slide that I showed you. So. Um, first, you do get herd immunity from vaccination, but you do get some, you know, strength and antibody responses from natural infection. You know, so people who didn't get vaccinated, but did get COVID and have survived, many people do amount of immune response. Um, you know, is that immune response going to be as durable as vaccines? Uh, no. You know, one thing I'll go over later is that people who do get infected and then even get a vaccine after they've been infected have some of the best immunity in the world. Um, you know, that's uncomparable to anything that you can get. And so, you know, if you're somebody who was hesitant, but then got COVID, um, definitely still get the vaccination. Um, you know, you would have a, a very potent and broad immune response. But to answer your question, um, you know, I think this, the DC kind of metropolitan area, which includes this part of Maryland, um, has been, you know, some of the most compliant with vaccinations. And so has some of the best herd immunity in the country, really. Um, and so when you think about your odds of exposure, it's gonna be considerably less than you're in, when you're in other regions like, um, you know, like my, my home state of Indiana where vaccination rates are, are quite a bit less. Um, that being said, when you think about herd immunity, I think that herd, herd immunity, what I get more concerned about is the variants. So like the Delta variant. Um, you know, the vac one imperfection of the vaccines we have right now is that while they, um, are extremely effective at preventing hospitalization or death, um, they don't prevent transmission. And so, you know, you, and we're seeing that now, cases where people have asymptomatic infection or mild infections despite being vaccinated, and they can then pass that on to people who, um, who have been unvaccinated or don't have a strong um, response from vaccinated. Um, and those aren't really protected. People aren't really protected for them herd immunity. And the Delta virus can result in, um, you know, maybe somebody got infected with the original, some of the original strains and had mild infection, 
the Delta virus or the Delta virus can cause a much more severe infection in people. And so luck with one doesn't necessarily translate with luck to luck towards another variant. Um, so I, you know, I, I hope I answered that question. I think that in terms of herd immunity, um, I think that, you know, Prince George County is one of, in one of the better situations um, compared to other places around the country. Uh, that being said, we all travel, people come in and out of Prince George community or from the Prince George uh, County area and Montgomery County area all the time that aren't from our region. Um, you know, we travel a lot too. And so there are always ways for there to be vulnerabilities to our own herd immunity. Okay. I think we got all of them. You can go ahead. All right. We'll go ahead and, and move forward then. Okay, vaccine development process. So development of new vaccines has multiple steps that are associated with it. So the steps for vaccine development start with the preclinical phase. So this is the phase of laboratory research that involves discovery of potential vaccine candidates and whether they might stimulate the immune system. This also includes animal testing uh, before the candidate is then tested in humans. The next step uh, before human testing is manufacturing quality. So what this means is that um, there are very strict regulations where people verify the product is actually present, how much of it is present, and that it is absent of any tampering. So it's exactly what you know the scientists or the pharmaceutical companies say it is. They check the purity to make sure there aren't any impurities that have been introduced that could impact uh, impact its administration into humans and its potency. So they wanna verify that the product does what it's expected to do, um, that it still works to stimulate the immune system. And all of these characteristics are verified uh, using quality control tests. So as I'd alluded to, uh, the traditional vaccine development pathway has been very long. And I think that you can say that it's roughly about a decade. Um, certainly you can plus or minus that, but it's, it's a long time. The preclinical phase can itself take many, many years. And then once that happens, it moves into phase one to three trials for about three to five years. And then once, while the vaccine is being tested in people, the FDA is also assessing information pertain pertaining to the manufacturing of the vaccine and the facility where it will be made on a larger scale. So once it goes from manufacturing, um, they ensure that the vaccine can then be produced reliably and consistently with purity. So companies submit a biologics license application to the FDA. And so this application is a comprehensive submission that's submitted to the agency. It includes all the preclinical, the laboratory data, the animal data, clinical information, as well as any details of the manufacturing process and the facilities themselves. So after this evaluation, the FDA decides whether to approve, also known as a license, um, to approve the vaccine or license the vaccine for use in the United States. If the FDA approves the vaccine, the company is permitted to market and distribute it in the United States for use um, in all of our populations for which it's been approved. So this is what happened to the vaccine development pipeline when COVID-19 emerged. As you can see, it was shortened. However, we did not skip steps. Instead, what happened is that we were overlapping these steps. This time, it was much faster too because the government was able to clear the pathway of bureaucracy. So that 10-year pipeline, one thing I didn't note in those is the bureaucracy, so the, the paper pushing um, that was required to push that, to move things along. Um, also, there's a lot of money that was infused into this that isn't normally infused in a non-emergent setting. So when you get rid of the bureaucracy, you have lots of money, and then you get companies to focus only on one task, as well as getting people to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it turns out we are capable of producing vaccine in a year or less. And that's what happened in this, in this scenario. So it is important to note too that with these overlapping steps, there was a certain amount of risk that the government and pharmaceuticals were willing to make. So for instance, if you look at the human clinical trials block, 
they started manufacturing the vaccines when the phase three was only partially complete. So this was actually a financial risk for the government and pharmaceutical companies. They started making expensive product that was ready to deploy in, a, in the event that the phase three trial, uh, in event that the phase three, phase three trial when all said and done, showed that the vaccine was gonna be successful. But it's important to note that there's still a risk it wasn't going to be. So the data could have gone in a completely different direction. And if that was the case, there would have been a huge financial loss because they would have had to dispose of these millions of vials of vaccines that weren't shown to be effective. Um, however, in this scenario, luck was on our side. The data did show them to be effective. And, and so it was able to be moved forward in this way. Well, how do clinical trials show whether the vaccines work and are safe? So what clinical trials do is, as you can see on the far left, we collect a group of patients, we create a large cohort of people. So research then compare these people who get the vaccine to a comparison group of those who do not get the vaccine. And so this inactive product that they give in the control group, group is usually something like normal saline. So researchers then compare the number of people who get the COVID disease in the vaccine group compared to that of those who just get something like a, like a saline injection. And so large trials are needed to make sure that the researchers can then re reliably see differences between the two groups, those who get it and those who don't. And so researchers are constantly checking for safety issues and side effects for all participants in the trial. And so as like a, a quick side note, um, that's sort of related to this, oh, sorry about that, is do the current vaccines protect, protect against COVID variants such as the Delta variant? You know, are we going through all this process of clinical trials and manufacturing, putting all this together for it to then just kind of be a bunch of hogwash? Um, the current vaccines do protect against the current Delta, vir Delta variant and against all variants. And so, while people who have been vaccinated may become infected somewhat more easily with the Delta variant, they are still protected from severe disease and death. And that is still very, very important. Additionally, it's expected that more variants will emerge. And so how this impacts the pipeline that I just went through is that a lot of the um, quality checks have already put in, put in place. And so our ability to um, you know, move through vaccine candidates that can, um, that can then sort of uh, combat new variants that emerge and might be stronger uh, will be much faster, which is reassuring. So we'll use this as an opportunity to open up for a few more questions and Beza, I'll let you take care of the questions and take a look at the time as well. Um, we can take maybe two questions. Um, so we have a question here. How are animals like gorillas, lions, and tigers um, contract Con contracting COVID when I thought this was a virus that infected humans only? Yeah, so excellent question. Um, so coronaviruses uh, in general, so COVID-19 is not the only coronavirus that there is. Um, the, one, the coronaviruses that I think are more familiar to us are the ones that infect humans, like COVID-19. Um, you probably heard of SARS-1 that infected a lot of people um, in East Asia many years ago, as well as the MERS virus that um, impacted a lot or created a lot, of, um, a lot of serious illness and even death in the Middle East many years ago as well. Um, so coronaviruses can also cause the common cold. And that's how before COVID-19, they really impacted the United States was just the plain old cold. Um, coronaviruses in general are capable of infecting multiple different types of species. Um, so even our, our dogs, our cats, our tigers, our um, gorillas, uh, they can get colds. And so coronaviruses in that sense are, are very tricky um, in that they can inf infect multiple, diff multiple species. And that's also how um, viruses can jump from animals to humans in that they might be able to infect a certain animal, um, you know, whether it be a gorilla or a tiger or a cat or something like that, um, and then the virus creates its own variants and mutates in a way that it is eventually able to infect humans. Um, so there is a little bit of, there's more crossover than I think what is um, really known to the public between 
I guess, viruses and things that, you know, we get in addition to other different types of animal species get. Um, and it's a similar infection process, but I think the best comparison is that a variant emerges that is then able to then go into different animal species. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and um, how do we recruit humans to clinical research? Yeah, um, that's been a huge part of my life over the past year. Um, you know, I people who part, participate in clinical trials, that's a, a tremendous public service because like I said, uh, you know, you're, you're offering up your, your healthy body um, to test something that doesn't have a lot of experience in humans. And, um, you know, I think understandably so, a lot of people are hesitant to do that. And in, during this pandemic, tens of thousands of people uh, volunteered themselves and their bodies to do that for, for the greater good. And um, so I, I personally have a lot of um, admiration uh, for people who do that. The way that we recruit it is that it's, it's actually more simple than what you'd expect. Um, we, people who um, have previously had been involved in clinical trials, um, you know, for instance, we've had yellow fever vaccines at Walter Reed. Um, we've had a malaria vaccine and we've advertised those. You'll see sometimes see med advertisements on the Metro. You might see advertisements on Facebook or even on Craigslist, or um, there might be a, uh, um, like some publicity in the newspaper related that. And usually it's through those types of advertisements and recruitment methods that we get, we get people. We've also had people directly reach out and say, hey, you know, what's going on? How can I get involved? And, you know, we integrate them into the system. Um, so it was from a pool of people that we, you know, have previous experience with our other clinical trials, but also new people. A lot of people reached out to us, um, not just to us, but other places that were running clinical trials in general uh, during the height of COVID and say, hey, I want to help out. How can I do that? And so they were just placed on a short list and do that. So if you were to Google clinical trials COVID, um, clinical trials COVID Walter Reed, clinical trials NIH, um, there should be contact information, um, either an email or a phone number about how you can do that and how you can get on the short list. And so that's, you know, wasn't nothing special that we did um, in order to be able to recruit people, um, just sort of general word of mouth, uh, as well as public advertisements. And as I said, it was all voluntary. Okay, I one more question that I neglected to uh, bring to your attention was that there was a statement um, about anaphylaxis can occur after being vaccinated and it can kill us quickly. Is that true? Yeah, so anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction. So it's, you know, if somebody's allergic to peanuts, for instance, and then they have like a peanut butter sandwich or actually has something that had a little bit of peanuts in it. Um, you know, what anaphylaxis is, is like severe multi-organ swelling and difficulty to breathe. Um, so when I say anaphylaxis, that's an allergy that anybody can have, an a strong inflammatory reaction that your body has to something. Um, so anything that you put in your body, whether it be food, whether it be medication, uh, whether it be a vaccine, does carry the risk of someone having an allergy to it and even a severe allergy to it. Um, and one of the ways that they have found to best, uh, I guess, mitigate that, um, like I said, is to have that half hour of observation uh, where they evaluated people half hour after it was administered. Because if anaphylaxis is going to happen, it's something that's going to happen right away. Um, it's not something that happens, you know, two or three days later after you got it. It's something that occurs pretty quickly after you ingested that. Um, and so signs and symptoms of, of that you know, would be like hives or an itchy throat or difficulty breathing. Um, you know, deaths of that have become extremely rare, um, especially with time as we've gotten better with no noticing that uh, for the vaccines and putting measures in place to kind of keep an, keep an eye on people as well. And like I said, occur in, you know, anywhere from one to four in a million at this point. Um, for that, Dr. Shepard, one more question that, that we can take before proceeding is that in the earlier stages of the pandemic, we would, we would often hear reports indicating that the severity of the illness and risk factors were higher among the 
elderly population and the children were were children were like were less likely to experience significant illness. I'm sure this is a very complex complex, but can you briefly explain this difference within the immune immune system? Yeah, I think what it goes down to, like I said, is is the aging immune system. You know, all parts of our bodies age with time, um, and that's that's just a simple fact of being human. And so, you know, young kids. Um, so so babies. Babies are a little different. So when I say young kids, there are all sorts of stipulations because babies in a sense, or kids under the age of five are still developing their immune system. And so they can be particularly vulnerable for a different reason. And that reason is because they're still growing. Beyond the age of five, um, it becomes a little bit more different, um, you know, because our, our body has, their bodies have encountered things. They've, you know, have a more fully developed immune system. Um, you know, those of us, you know, those, who are over the age of 65 though, um, you know, their bodies have encountered all sorts of pathogens. And so it has tons and tons of experience, but it's getting tired. Um, and it, it just, it can often take longer to produce an antibody response and the antibodies not, might not be as responsive or they might forget a little bit more. Um, you know, certainly that is different from person to person. You know, um, I, I think, you know, one 65 year old, it can be very different from another 65 year old. You know, I think also as you get older um, and based on different illnesses that people have as well as lifestyle choices, you know, I, I think I'm one to um, argue that not every 65 year old is the same as another 65 year old. And so there are differences with that, but I think in general, I, you can expect that it, like I said, it's just a very simple idea that the immune system ages, and um, that's not something that science has yet uh, found a solution or answer to. Great, thank you. Uh, we have so many questions that are coming in, and I, I mean, we're so grateful that you're asking these questions, and this is why we're, you know, holding this program. We are going to get to them um, perhaps at the end, and if we don't get to them at the end of the program, We'll be sure to compile a response and send it to you um, as a follow up. Okay. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and move forward to some of the other. Oh, I can't get the slides moved forward. There we go. So we'll move on to some myths and myths and misconceptions. And this is to address a lot of the information that's going through. So, uh, you know, I think one thing that's been frustrating about the pandemic is. We're getting information from all kinds of sources. So the media is going on 24 seven. So you're hearing information from CNN and, and Fox and the New York Times and the Washington Post. And then you go on Facebook and COVID's on Facebook and then you get Snapchat or Instagram or it's just, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. And so, you know, I think that unsurprisingly people have their, their preferences of where they get their information uh, because it's just too much. You know, um, we need to narrow it down. You know, we can't just follow everything. And, you know, it, it does turn out that the quality though of information that we can get about COVID um, and about SARS-CoV-2 and the vaccines can differ from place to place. And so, you know, one thing that I find is especially striking and, you know, this wasn't broken down by age. So I think it'd be interesting to see what the age group is for, for these breakdowns. But nearly 80% of Americans who get news on Snapchat and on TikTok view social media as an important way of getting vaccine news. So this is important to know, um, you know, because what that means is that it doesn't matter how rigorous NPR is. It doesn't necessarily matter how rigorous New York Times is or whatever, you know, the National Geographic, it, the vast majority of people are paying attention to their social media and what's being presented on there. And the quality of that information can vary. It varies, depends on who they follow on social media, who's sending them that information. And so, as you, you know, as you can imagine, there's just a wide range of information. It's hard to know what to believe. And so I think, you know, certainly from this, future work is going to have to be involved of how to, um, you know, in certain scenarios, whether it's a public health emergency or another, but how do you purposely improve the quality of that information? And what does, what does that mean? What does that look like? And 
that's a, that's an expertise and a rabbit hole that, you know, is, is beyond, beyond my, um, my professional training, but I know that lots and lots of people are going to be going after that, but I think it is important to, to note and look at where people are getting their information. And, you know, my goal is to provide uh, the most honest information that I can and scientific information based on what, what we know. And so some myths and, myths and misconceptions that float around is, um, you know, will COVID-19 vaccines modify your DNA? So, you know, like the, the vaccines that we have out there, you know, we say the mRNA vaccines, the DNA vaccines, and uh, with very little explanation of, of what it is that means or what they do. And so I can understand where where if you're you know, playing a game of, of telephone where you, know, you whisper something to somebody's ear and they whisper it into another person's ear, that that message just gets completely lost um, by the time you reach, reach the last person. And you know, I think you know, a lot of um, public health workers and physicians and scientists, and you know, they forget that, you know, that, like I said, that game of telephone is being played on social media. Um, it's being played through news outlets. And so it's actually very easy to have a lot of misconceptions about, about what this means. But, you know, as somebody who has worked, you know, directly with, um, you know, with scientists and public health workers on, on a COVID vaccine, um, it, none, of the, none of these vaccine products are used for COVID um, or it, really any mRNA or DNA uh, vaccine actually modify your DNA. Um, and so they use technology that is made from, you know, certain pieces that are similar to that used in mRNA or DNA uh, to stimulate your body to create COVID or the COVID spike protein or to carry genes of the viruses. But neither of these vaccine pr products actually persist long-term in your human body. So another common question is, can the COVID vaccines make a person infertile? So this is a very common question. I think um, certainly among women of childbearing age, but I've also heard that come up uh, as a question for men uh, who are also interested in, uh, in having children in the near future as well. And, um, you, know, you know, pregnant women are a vulnerable group of people. You know they're going to be carrying another human being that's going to be living and growing for them, and so I can see where that hesitancy and fear can come in because we want to be safe about what we put into our bodies. Um, you know, luckily with time, there has been lots of evidence that has shown that women who become pregnant, uh, or women become pregnant at the same rate whether they are vaccinated or not, and there's been no differences in outcomes. And so that's a major sigh of relief for everyone. Um, you know. What they tested is, is antibodies that from, or they tested, you know, what is the pregnancy rate and what is the outcome for women with antibodies who have been vaccinated against COVID, um, antibodies from having a recent infection with the virus, and then no antibodies from no exposure at all. So somebody who's, uh, you know, been quarantining and confined at home and has had zero exposure. And like I said, they found no differences in pregnancy success rates among the three groups. They have shown that you know, women who are pregnant um, that subsequently uh, get COVID are at higher risk themselves um, for major complications, not just with the childbirth, but with their own health, as well as at higher risk for death um, if they get COVID through natural infection while being pregnant. Another thing is that antibodies from vaccines and natural infection, um, you know, if somebody is, you know, does well and, uh, you know, survives the infection, are present in breast milk. And so, you know, I, I think one thing that is reassuring about this is that whether it's from the vaccines or through natural infection, that the antibodies can be passed along to the no newborn, which is fantastic, especially as I had said, where you know, newborns, especially up to the age of, of five, um, you know, they're still developing their immune systems. They're still learning. And part of the way their immune system learns is through, um, through their mothers. Another thing that has come up is, are there microchips in vaccines? And no, there are no microchips in vaccines. I think one way that, um, you know, this has been a source of confusion is that we talk about nanotechnology. 
So on one of those, the older slides, I had showed you those, um, especially for the mRNA vaccine, the little oil particles that contain the mRNA in it, that's considered nanotechnology. So nanotechnology is anything that um, creates small particles. And in this situation, it's a small particle that is suitable to stimulate the immune response. But nanotechnology isn't the same thing as a microchip. So nanotechnology can be used to create microchips. Nanotechnology can be used to create multiple different things, including things that aren't microchips at all. And so, like I said, nan um, nanotechnology, it refers to things that are between one and 100 nanometers. Um, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's like a foreign body, like a, like a, um, like a microchip. And so while it's possible to use nanotechnology to deliver microchips, there are so many other uses for it besides this and will be used in decades to come for not just vaccines, but also different medical therapeutics. The question is, was the vaccine development timeline, timeline too rushed? So as I mentioned previously, the steps in the vaccine approval process for you for EUA uh, included all the usual data collection activities, along with some risk that pharmaceutical companies and the FDA took on. Um, it was more that the steps were overlapping, which was enabled by lots of money, lots of people you know, volunteering their time, as well as a huge influx of government support um, to remove some of the bureaucracy in order to get the vaccines tested more quickly. And that's why it went more quickly. Um, this is something that's not practical to do for every single disease in a non-emergent setting, but in this scenario it was, and that's why it was able to go faster. And as a next question, can a person be protected from getting sick with COVID by eating healthy foods and taking vitamins? So healthy foods alone does not protect against COVID-19. And so people who have been very healthy, unfortunately have become very sick and even died from COVID-19 infection. And we don't quite know why. Um, you know, I, I wish I had a direct answer, but we're still trying to figure that out. And we don't have a good answer or explanation for why that occurs. But that being said, people who have a long standing history of exercising, and eating healthy, are much less likely to be hospitalized or to experience death. So maintaining a healthy lifestyle in general puts the odds in your favor. Okay, so this specific question goes towards vitamin D, um, but I've also heard of vitamin C, I've heard of zinc, um, and these are all critical for a well-functioning immune system. Uh, they play an important role in promoting your health and are part of a well-balanced diet, but having these as supplements, um, there has been no research, and this has been researched, uh, to suggest that these as supplements are effective at, um, at treating COVID-19. And so how can we tell if the pharmaceutical companies are telling the truth about the vaccines? Um, I hear you. <laughs> you know, as in, um, you know, I, I took a Hippocratic oath to treat people, um, you know, regardless of the disease that they come in for and regardless of their status. And, um, you know, I think pharmaceutical companies, I've always had this love-hate uh, relationship with. Um, I love them in the sense that they're so capable of producing excellent products. They have, you know, this concentrated effort of expertise and they have the money to see these, their vision through and they can do it very well. They frustrate me because you have to have a disease that, um, that helps them make money. And so, you know, how I viewed them in the past is that, you know, as long as you have a disease that um, it can't be cured or ha has no known cure, uh, like diabetes, for instance, you can expect that there's going to be multiple options available to you. However, trying to get them to fund uh, work for curative treatments like antibiotics is difficult because there is no market if you cure a disease. And so that's where my love-hate relationship comes with pharmaceutical companies is that I wanna treat and cure everyone to the best of my ability regardless of what they have. Um, but they're a money-making institution. And so they tend to focus on areas of where money can be made. So you know, when I look at this in the context of COVID-19, um, 
they have been all in and they've provided the expertise. They've provided the tremendous amount of resources and money that would not be possible, honestly, without them. There's no way that the government or academia could have funded these large scale clinical trials at the speed that they did without the pharmaceutical companies. So um, yeah, I, like I said, I, I hear you. Um, and I'm, I'm not someone who's afraid to take pharmaceutical companies to task for these items. But I think in this scenario that when you're curious about the quality of their products, they do produce quality products and they have to follow us very rigorous standards. Um, independent advisory committees who thoroughly look through their information and their data uh, before what a pharmaceutical company proposes is appro approved for the, for the public. So they are heavily regulated. Another point is, can, um, can vaccines actually cause COVID-19 illness? And you know, I think this is an, an excellent analogy that you see on the screen here, where you can have different pieces of a bike, where you can have the handlebars, you can have the chains, you can have the wheel. That doesn't mean you have a bike in front of you. And even when you have all the pieces, it might not be assembled and be a functioning bike. So this is kind of similar to what vaccines are. And since where we got a few bits and pieces of the, of the virus, but it's nothing that's gonna create an active virus itself in your body that will then perpetuate. And then before we go to a general Q and A, we'll ask some more, or we'll go through some more frequently asked questions. So should you get vaccinated if you have already had a disease? Absolutely. So, you know, those who have previously had uh, the virus, whether it's one of the original stains or even the Delta variant, um, there's information that, sh that demonstrates that even if you just get one shot, and that's even one shot of Pfizer or Moderna, wh which is expected to have two, that that's enough to create a very strong immune response in your body. One that is tremendously broad and tremendously effective. And, you know, there are studies that are ongoing, but you know, that might provide the most potent and broad immune response of against COVID that we have to date. So, um, you know, personally, I think that people who have been previously infected, I absolutely get the vaccine. I would, I would just, you know, take the, take what you can get and the, get the best option for your body. Um, you know, you were lucky that, you know, you weren't somebody that the virus was able to, to take down, which it has for many people. And, use that, I think, to your advantage to get an even better re immune response by also having the vaccine supplement it. And so how long will vaccine protection last? That's an ongoing question. So like I said, science is going on in real time um, and that's communicated to the public as we know. What we're learning is that the vaccine responses do wane with time. Uh, so one reason why people who've gotten Pfizer might need a booster is because Pfizer um, seems to wane a little bit faster than those who've gotten Moderna. Um, so boosters are a strong possibility for those who've gotten the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, you know, we are seeing that, you know, six, eight months out uh, with either of them, they're still effective in the vast majority of the population at preventing severe disease and even death. Uh, but, you know, the long-term protection over how many years, how many months, that's still an ongoing question that we're regularly testing. And you know, another common question is, can you mix vaccines? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, I think that if you get Pfizer or Moderna, ideally for your second shot, um, if, if you get it, uh, would be the same. But you know, this is something that is still an active area of testing. I think it is entirely possible in the future we may discover that mixing and matching, mi mixing and matching different vaccines may provide a better immune response than you know, sticking with the same vaccine the entire time. Um, and there's, there's information from previous diseases to expect that that's a possibility. Um, but we don't know if that's the case right now. And so I think that um, you know, the best we know right now is that by you know, taking the same vaccine, you get an excellent response. We don't know exactly what happens with the second shot, but we know you still get an excellent response, whether that's better or worse. Um, you know, it's still something we're actively looking at and collecting data on. So short answer is if you have to mix and match, I wouldn't sweat it. I would still get it. And, you know, the future might reveal that you're actually in a better position. 
do people still need to wear masks after they get vaccinated? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> I know that's frustrating to all of us. Um, you know, the vaccines will prevent you from getting severely ill with COVID, but like I said, one shortfall of the current, vaccine, current vaccines is they still pre prevent transmission. And so even if you're somebody who's likely to have had a strong response from the vaccine, other people in the community may still be at risk, whether they're unvaccinated, whether they're a child under the age of 12, whether they're um, you know, somebody over the age of 65, whether they're somebody with a condition like you know, being on chemotherapy from cancer that makes them less able to produce an immune response, they still do. So it's, it's a civic duty really to wear your mask to protect these other people. And so why do we need more clinical research on COVID-19? Um, so we need another, we need more COVID vaccines. And so, like I said, there are shortfalls to our current ones. One is that we need vaccines that will help us stop transmission, whether that's through a combination of ones that we have right now, or by adding additional ones into the mix that can stop transmission, because stopping transmission is the only way that we can really turn this from a pandemic to an epidemic or, you know, something much, much more simple. Also, like the current vaccines that we have, they require really, really cold storage conditions. And the United States is able to accommodate that, but you know we can't get that to other parts of the world, especially when you consider uh, remote areas of Africa or um, you know other various rural regions around the world. And so it becomes impractical in many settings. And this is a one world disease uh, you know, where COVID-19 doesn't stop until truly it stops for everyone. And so that's an important priority is we need ones that are stable at say room temperature. Um, more vaccines are also need to cover other populations. It'd be fantastic if we find a vaccine that works better in those over the age of 65, for instance, um, or even different populations around the world. You know, those are areas of active interest. And so, Vaccine research is ongoing, um, you know, not just at Walter Reed, but around the world because we're trying to improve upon this and make this better and better. And it, it takes time, um, you know, all hands are still on deck. And so, you know, one way is that I think that this surprised everyone in the general public is, you know, suddenly clinical trials were, were visible. It's something we kind of maybe all knew about in the background, but really didn't know much about. And, um, you know, suddenly COVID sprung upon us and we're, you know, all expected to become experts at this, to know what a clinical trial is, to know what the process is to gaining um, authorization for a vaccine. And it's overwhelming, quite frankly. And, you know, so I, I think that one thing that I would encourage people to do is to give a clinical trial a try. Um, and I say this because, you know, clinical trials, there will be different levels of comfort and that's okay. Um, you know, clinical trials don't necessarily mean, you know, going and getting in, injected with a, a vaccine, you know, volunteering yourself for first in human testing. Uh, you know, that, that takes a certain level of bravery, and I think everybody understands that. But, you know, you can, you can volunteer to be a healthy control. You know, there are certain studies that are actively recruiting people to not get anything. They just want to know you know, if you go about your normal daily habits, you know, what does that do? So that way they can compare it to people who are doing something different. Um, there are also clinical trials for things like sleep studies or, you know, different, you know, different changes in dietary patterns or, you know, things that are, that you may be more, more comfortable with. But I think in general, I would, I would encourage you in whatever way you might feel comfortable participating is give a clinical trial a try. You know, if you want to try, um, first in human testing with a therapeutic or vaccine, like, great, go for it. But there's so many things that are, I think, less intimidating. Uh, so, yeah, so many scenarios that are less intimidating that you can get involved with with clinical trials. And so I would encourage you to look them up, um, not just for Walter Reed, but the NIH or, you know, any other facilities around our community that might be actively doing them and just see what it's about. You know, what is the process? And I, I think that um, you might be might be surprised and hopefully comforted. So I wanna thank everyone for your time. I think, um, you know, I'll leave it to Beza about whether we have time for additional questions or if those should be fielded for the end. But um, I've enjoyed sharing this information with you and talking with you. And I, I hope that it has helped clarify some things. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Shepard. I'm gonna go ahead. We have 
a lot of questions in the chat box. I know we are a little bit over our alloc uh, allocated time, but if you want to stay um, to 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 hear the responses to see some of these questions, please please go ahead and do so. I know if, if you have other commitments and you have to leave, that's also completely understandable. But we also really ask you to complete that evaluation form that I have shared a link to in the chat box. Your feedback is gonna really help us improve our programming for the future, the community engagement uh, program that we have at Walter Reed Institute of Research is meant to be uh, a way to really provide resources and information and be a one-stop one shop, one shop for not only education, but capacity building um, within uh, the community. So please go ahead and complete that evaluation form. Um, in terms of questions, we have one um, here from Jamila. Today, we, we see an increase of young children becoming ill with the virus. As more adults are receiving the vaccine, does this increase the, the threat among children, especially those under five? Um, is, the question, is the question that the fact that more children are able to get, are getting infected, increasing the risk for younger kids or? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, certainly. I think that, you know, one reason why we're probably seeing more by way of um, younger people getting sick is that adults, you know, adults 18 and older were some of the first to get the vaccines. And so, you know, that did, you know, push, push the virus in a way um, towards other, I guess you could say, victims. Um, where the unvaccinated and a large part of the vaccination is young people. And so the virus then like the Delta variant was able to morph in such a way uh, that it enabled it to have a greater predilection for, um, for children and for younger people and does put babies at, at a higher risk. And, you know, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that a variant could, um, could evolve um, to be more potent against infants. Um, you know, I, I think that we're seeing now where we're seeing a lot more children who are being hospitalized, which wasn't the case with the original strains. Um, like I said, I, I can't predict the future, but I, I don't think that it's outside of the realm of possibility that, um, you know, kids in general have, um, have remained unvaccinated, and, you know, could continue to remain some of the most vulnerable populations that we have moving forward because the virus has been able to kind of live in them for a little bit longer and move between them a little bit longer. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I, I believe we've addressed the question about, um, let's see, one more. Yeah, we've addressed all, all of, most of all the questions that we have in the chat box. These were just fantastic questions we were, really looking forward to this kind of interaction and engagement. So thank you for keeping it lively and a wonderful questions that you, you brought up to our attention. Um, just a few last minute details. I wanna first really sincerely thank Dr. Shepard for putting together this, this wonderful presentation. I also wanna thank Dr. Davis, Audrey Davis for, uh, from Prince George's Community College for working with us to put this program together and make it available to our community and also the Prince George's community um, college staff. So thank you. This is not going to be our last one. We're going to we're hoping to provide uh, other programs in this series. So I want to um, sincerely thank you for that. We we have recorded this program, so we'll be sharing the recording alongside the PowerPoint presentation with you in the follow up as well as um, questions to any of the questions we might have missed. I know some of you have also, I've seen my email right now, you've sent me your questions um, that you wanted to address in, in a follow-up. So we'll be sure to, to really, uh, take the time to respond to all of your questions. With that said, I think uh, that's all that we have for you. I do encourage you to go ahead and complete that evaluation form. I'm like a broken record right now, but it really is gonna help us um, improve our programming for the future. So please take the moment to do so. And if you don't do it right now, I'm gonna go ahead and send you the link 
in the follow-up, so you'll have the opportunity to do so at, at your convenience. Thank you all so much for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you in future programming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.